Welcome to the first DBRS Morningstar U.S. RMBS Frontline Perspectives webinar of 2022. Today we will cover topics from the from our 2022 U.S. RMBS Outlook uh, report that was that's available on our website. Um, I'm Richard Bianchi. I manage the U.S. Structured Finance Business Development Team for ABS RMBS and Structured Credit. I'm joined by Mark Fontanella, a global research consultant for the DBRS Morningstar Structured Finance Team. Um, and we'll, we will respond to questions at the end of this, uh, of, a, of the prepared remarks. Or, um, we will see the, that the questions in the chat. So if you have a question, please just uh, put it in the chat, in the chat and we will see it. So, um, so Mark, to, to start with the obvious, COVID-19 is a game changer. Uh, there's a there's a lot to talk about, and and you know certainly it's been, there's been an unprecedented use of the word unprecedented <laughs> over the last few years. So from a macro perspective, we'll start with a macro perspective. Please provide your views on um, the home and housing markets, uh, um, and you know we'll have go through several topics. But let's start with uh, government interventions. Sure. And speaking of government, uh, thank you, everybody, for showing up. I know we're going up against the, the FOMC statement release and Jay Powell's testimony at 2.30. So, uh, but hopefully this will be as enlightening as, as uh, the Fed. So <laughs> thanks for everybody for joining. So as far as government intervention goes, uh, I know we had talked about this previously on past webinars, but the, uh, in 2021 really was a resilient and consolidation year for mortgage credit performance. And there's a lot of different factors, but I think government intervention provided a lot of the fuel. So if we go back and look comparison between what happened during the mortgage crisis back in 2007, 2008, and the current COVID crisis, kind of the path and trajectory and what happened, a lot of things that happened, you know, kind of post pandemic announcement, were the reverse of the financial crisis. So you would expect the credit performance and the markets to uh, perform in the reverse of that downturn. So as an example, um, the root cause wasn't mortgages this time. Mortgages were an after effect or housing was an after effect of the pandemic and the lockdowns and so on and so forth. So econ economic conditions um, were somewhat similar going into both crises. But again, the downturns were very, very sharp, much sharper than we've seen in history um, heading into the COVID crisis. But the recovery was also equally um, as brisk. And so the markets generally recovered. Issuance came back in RMBS particularly. Um, once we got through Q2, Q3, um, really in Q3 and Q4 of 2020, things came back quite a bit. So 2021 um, was a consolidation year. So that continued. We had records across issuance. Uh, home prices hit all-time highs. We had a number of other records in the securitization space. So it was a very robust market. And also, too, the credit performance was resilient, despite high delinquencies, by the persistence of the COVID pandemic um, and late-stage delinquency pipelines across RMBS remaining elevated. Uh, the realized losses are what was really resilient. So despite high delinquencies, we saw realized losses either uh, you know, kind of come down um, as you know, versus what is expected. And so that uh, was due to a number of different factors. And I think Rich had mentioned some things uh, as far as uh, you know, what those considered, but you can basically categorize a lot of those things into you know, kind of federal policies, monetary policy, and just housing activity and mortgages itself. So let's start off with things like uh, monetary policy. If you look at the rate environment, and also the macroeconomic environment too. Just let's fr let's frame this because I think it's important. You know, uh, right. rising tides uh, raise all ships. So RMBS sectors, from the prime credit to um, peripheral credits, they all benefited from the same condition. So part of it was economic backdrop. If you look at unemployment right now, is uh, at 3.9 percent as of the last release. It started 2021 at 6.7. So 6.7 to 3.9. So Credit in general uh, obviously improves in performance when you have that improving backdrop of unemployment. Uh, inflation, which is a uh, kind of counter, uh, started the year at, at 2021 at 1.2%, according to CPI. The latest numbers are at 7%. So you can look at that a couple of different ways. Inflation is obviously a worry to market participants, but also too, you wanna think about it as that's, a, that's an after effect uh, of brisk economic activity. So that's a positive from that standpoint and uh, you know, existing or seasoned debt service. 
Um, but let's look at the rate structure. Uh, Fed funds. Fed funds started uh, before COVID was at 150, the lower limit. Um, once COVID hit, it went right to zero, and we haven't seen zero since uh, the mortgage crisis. And as of today, they're still at zero, but the Fed, and they may have said something at 2 o'clock or will say something at 2.30 around what the outlook may be for that possibly going higher, and there's a lot of talk in the market about rates getting pressured higher. Um, let's look at the discount rate, another benchmark rate that entered 2021 at zero. It's still zero. So basically looking at an environment where it's asymmetric risk for rates to go higher. Um, so let's look at things that matter to the mortgage market. The 10 year, for instance, entered 2021 at uh, 93 basis points. Uh, right now it's around 170 basis points. So quite a bit higher, but that drove mortgage rates. So 30 mortgage rates dropped down again to uh, close to historic lows during 2021. Uh, at two and five eighths during 2021, and then finally ended, you know, on an upward swing, and now we're at above uh, 350 on the 30-year mortgage rate. So a lot of that pressure changes the landscape. So when we talk about, uh, you know, in our written outlook, we talked about, you know, can this resilience continue? Part of it is understanding what the resilience and why it occurred. And then what that means going into 2022. And I think you'll see the theme is that 2022 is a different risk profile than 2021, although we enter on a good note and you know kind of positive trends. So if we shift a little bit from the rate environment and economics, let's look at home prices, which obviously had been uh, at the forefront and has provided a lot of impetus for you know good credit performance and very low realized losses. So here's something interesting. Um, to consider during the financial crisis, uh, the mortgage financial crisis, if you look at the trajectory using, let's say, the FHFA home price indices during the lead up to the peak home price period, which is 2006, um, the years leading up to that, it's uh, they ran, let's say, 2004 5 was around 7% year over year or annualized uh, home price growth. Then leading up to the financial crisis in 4 5, 2004 through 2006, you're looking at annual rises of about 10 percent now let's fast forward to the COVID crisis and heading into COVID um and the years before that home prices according to the fhfa indexes uh, were upwards uh annualized about let's say five to six percent now 2020 2019 2020 2021 that trajectory uh was 11 percent and right now the latest data point we have is november uh, that was just released, I believe, yesterday for the FHFA indices. And year to date for 2021, um, for the year, we're up at 17% with one month left to report. So in other words, the trajectory of home prices is faster, higher and faster during the COVID period uh, than even leading up to the financial crisis. So not to kind of comment on that, but again, the pace is much faster. And so part of that, uh, again, is different from if you look at the backside of that home price rise, uh, home prices went lower and lower for the next four or five years after the peak of the mortgage financial crisis. So this is the opposite. So again, we're setting a tone for things were the opposite. And so you should expect the opposite. But then once we go into 2022, a lot of these things make change. So the question for home prices and home activity is there's some technical factors like supply demand, but the home price rise, um, can that be sustained? And can you continue at 10, 17 and higher percentages? Um, that remains to be seen, but that poses a, a risk too, to the extent that that is higher than organically would otherwise be expected. So um, a lot of things are tied into the rate environment. So to the extent that you had all time low mortgage rates and a lot of migration, you know, this has been talked about a lot in the media as far as why there was a lot of home buying activity and still continues to be home buying activity from the technical standpoint to the cost standpoint and, uh, you know, kind of supply and demand was uh, overbalanced, you know, to the demand side. So that has helped performance, at least for the season deals. So season deals, in other words, pre-COVID deals that were originated before the pandemic was announced, those have performed better than probably originally expected given a lot of the interventions and the rate structure and the cost of borrowing. And not only that, let's, let's look back at a couple of things, I think, which are key. Um, what we just talked about, but also the availability of credit. The availability of credit um, was much right. different. The availability of credit during the mortgage financial crisis effectively disappeared except for possibly agency conforming loans. This time around, there was a hiatus for let's say one, two, three months or a quarter. 
and then things returned. And meanwhile, again, losses didn't really come through, although delinquencies were elevated due to uh, various different things like CARES Act forbearances um, and local. Uh, yeah, public. actually, so, uh, Mark, that was one thing I was, I, you know, in reading your report, just uh, two things that don't seem to follow, but, you know, you gave a lot of reasons, but I think it's worth discussing. We're seeing um, delinquencies higher than they've been, but um, credit enhancement in the and the underlying deals seems to be building. So, you know, maybe you can discuss why those two things that maybe wouldn't normally follow are, are, are occurring right now. Sure. And this applies to all the asset classes from prime credit to non-QM to CRT all the way down to uh, reverse mortgages, um, all dependent upon, you know, credit performance depends upon the collateral and depends upon the, uh, you know, asset liability or the debt service of the borrower. So to the extent that, it's a very uh, unusual environment to have uh, low rates, but when low rates, low benchmark rates, but also low borrowing rates, usually have spreads widened the other way in distressed environments. Uh, liquidity, in other words, the ability to get access to credit um, dissipates. This time it, it held or even improved in a lot of cases uh, to the extent that the loss, uh, loss mitigation activities were basically extended or curved because of forbearances, uh, whether it be at the federal or state level, and that forestalled any kind of liquidation scenarios. And so all of that together, meanwhile, rates were low, people were buying houses, people were moving. And so you had an environment where, to put it basically, you had low rates, high delinquencies, but high prepayment speeds, and virtually uh, very little losses. So that created a chance for structures to pay down, delever a lot faster than you would think. Uh, and or normally think. And so that was very unusual. Usually along when you have those conditions, um, again, spreads actually, you know, kind of widened and tightened. So in other words, issuer costs, therefore lending costs didn't widen dramatically, at least, uh, you know, after uh, Q2 or Q3 of 2020. And so you had a lot of the opposite things with the one exception is that you don't have realized losses come through. That's the one thing that was unique. So again, to reiterate, Fast prepayment speeds, liquidity for borrowers, high delinquencies, but very low losses. And again, that allows for uh, structural delevering and good performance whereby you don't see a lot of losses pass through to investors, at least yeah. initially. <laughs> yeah, that, that's great. And um, so so basically from a credit performance perspective, I mean, as, as you mentioned, but it's been strong kind of across the board and, and um Going into 2022, uh, your expectations is about to continue to improve, to steady, hold steady. Any any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, as I said before, entering uh, 2022, which we are in now, the trends continue. But to the extent that there is as much upside as there was in 2021, uh, I think that upside is just, uh, it's more balanced. So you have uh, in kind of a situation where you have a little bit more balance where there's more downside relative to upside, relatively speaking. So are you mo moving to a more balanced position again? Do home prices, can they go up another 18% year over year for the next year? Possibly, um, but you know the likelihood is that that might be tempered. Prepayment speeds to help delevering, that's already showing the slowdown. There's already burnout shown um, since uh, the middle of the summer and the beginning of the summer last year across asset classes. So that's slowing down. So then you can actually bifurcate the, uh, you know, kind of the universe into pre-COVID deals. So season deals, then deals across asset classes that were issued during COVID. And so they have different pools of borrowers, different pools of collateral. And so um, to the extent that uh, the improving performance will likely continue for the season deals, albeit at uh, probably a slower pace. And then the upside for newer deals, it gets back to more balanced uh, versus, you know, possibly again having year-over-year -year, uh, HPA at 18% or or higher. So, yeah, well, that's great. Um, so I think that's I think that's uh, great from a macro perspective. Uh, move on to the next topic. Uh, and, and that's ESG. So I don't think we need to spend a lot of time here, but it, it's there's a lot of talk about ESG. Um, it looks like it is becoming it is, will become a bigger part of uh, the whole finance industry. You know, it's further along in Europe than it is in the United States. Um, DBRS Morningstar, our, our parent company Morningstar, bought a an ESG company called Sustainalytics. 
Um, and there's been some confusion around, okay, what does ESG mean to a rating agency and what does ESG mean to Sustainalytics and to a, a company that puts out second party opinions or puts out ESG ratings on corporates, it's really, are, is that company doing good things for the environment? Is it doing good things from a social perspective? Um, does it have good governance? So that's really, uh, Sustainalytics and other ESG companies will, will look at the ESG factors from that perspective. As a credit rating agency, where we're really just focused on the credit profile, um, it's really how do how does ESG affect the credit profile and the likelihood of repayment? So it's not about are you a good person or you get bad person or good entity or bad entity, but um, you know how will that affect the credit performance? So can you uh, discuss that a little bit? Yeah, sure. I think with uh, residential mortgages, uh, since it's obviously location based, real estate based, the uh, really what we're seeing is. Uh, you know, the the E part or the climate change actually is the very conspicuous these days. So if you really think about ESG, and obviously it's a very, um, very popular topic, uh, everyone, uh, not, I should say everyone, but most participants are looking at this as another consideration. And so it is certainly another consideration. Um, you know, these factors are looked at during the analytic process. But also remember too, it's also good to remind folks that uh, ESG factors and credit factors, they are simultaneous possibilities. So uh, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. Well, let's go back to climate change, for instance. That has become more conspicuous. Things like hurricanes, floods, things that sit inside FEMA zones or may not sit inside FEMA zones yet, um, the California wildfires, all of those things um, are possible credit risks to the extent that, uh, you know, how is it uh, catered to or taken care of? Is, is the insurance policy is appropriate? Um, so on and so forth. Uh, but those are also ESG factors as well. So to the extent that uh, you look at them as, you know, could be a credit risk and could be an ESG factor as well simultaneously, I think that's a that's a good way to look at it. Yeah, great. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, thanks for that. I think we can move on. So you know, I'd like to get into a little bit sector specific discussions. Um, and just starting with Prime, I think we've touched on this uh, quite a bit, but you know, if you look specifically at the uh, the Prime markets, you know, what's your what's your outlook for 2022? Any anything in particular that that is worthy of pointing out? Sure, I think the Prime sector, and really this is a comment on all residential mortgage securitizations. Um, if you look at it with a couple of key things, so we talked about government before. Uh, so let's look at a couple of key adoptions that are in place for this year. One is the conforming loan limit. Uh, so that went from 548,000 for a single family one unit, uh, and it's up to 647,000. So that's that's nearly a hundred thousand dollar rise and about 18 uh, percent year over year change. So. Um, to the extent that more loan sizes or bigger loans can qualify, that would qualify now um, for conforming uh, financing versus would sit in a prime jumbo deal. Uh, that's an example of where, because of this, and I'll also couple this with you know the QM rule um, and how that's changed, where it went uh, to not, not as a strict DTI you know threshold limit, but more pricing and categorization. Uh, framework. So what happens there is that let's say the conforming box, the um, the conforming box, and uh, we'll call it the QM box. Those two boxes, you know, maybe at the margin, you know, it depends on how you look at it, but maybe got a little bit wider. And then, so relative to the whole universe, does that mean that the margin maybe gets thinner but gets wider? So. Uh, to the extent that where loans, you know, you have the same borrowers can get different types of loans, different types of lenders, different types of execution. Uh, where do they end up in the residential mortgage backed security spectrum? And so Prime is one of those areas where uh, let's look at a couple of uh, trends. You know, for instance, there was a, a number, uh, there was a number of more uh, agency conforming deals, uh, more investor loan deals. 
Um, so if you look at that as a incremental expansion of the prime sector besides prime jumbos, uh, and also the entry of some other participants besides the major money center banks, uh, you see that prime credit expanded during 2021. And will that continue into 2022? Well, looking at just the prime sector, um, maybe different asset types, but again, because of that GSE conforming box, maybe uh, you have some things that will kind of move out of the prime credit uh, purview, but then other things that move in. So in other words, agency conforming because of pricing. Now, uh, there was some recent LL loan level price adjustments that were put into place, which made um, you know second homes and high balance loans more expensive to deliver to the GSEs. Does that you know, prompt more loans that would make more sense, especially economically in a prime credit securitization. So a lot of these things are kind of push-pull, uh, but really it's a theme of shifting uh, the configuration within the residential mortgage security space. Um, and then kind of let's, uh, let's continue with the prime credit, uh, you know, to the extent that, again, we talked about economics and LPAs would determine what that kind of a shift um, looks like. Also, too, you know, structures have remained stable. Uh, just a couple of anecdotes, not anecdotes, but evidence. Um, performance was really good for the prime credit space, as you would expect. The highest tier borrowers, the highest tier loans and collateral. So uh, losses virtually zero across nearly the entire sector. Um, delinquencies have come off their highs and uh, looks like, uh, based on the latest numbers, either DQ tests have been passed within the past uh, couple of quarters, or a lot of them will continue to, will pass, uh, you know, in 2022. So that's a, a lot of good credit upside, which you would expect from the crime, uh, prime credit space. Um, but also too, on the, on the margin, you may have different things like, uh, you know, the appraisal activity or what types of appraisals are used, um, you know, due diligence, those type of things at the margin from a deal perspective uh, may persist and may kind of become permanent adoptions. Um, and I think that uh, that flexibility, I think, will continue uh, given, again, the changing landscape and the reconfiguration of where loans end up. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's great. I mean, we uh, clearly have seen plenty of agency conforming uh, mortgages and in, in, in pools that were executed in the private label securitization market. So uh, let's move on to, to non-QM. Um, so in the non-QM market, again, you know, actually one thing that, that has been a problem for non-QM from time to time is when uh, there is a significant move in, in rates where rates get tighter, um, it seemed that many of the originators would shift all their resources to the, to the uh, agency conforming market and kind of leave non-QM in the, in the, in the dust. Um, but in a rising interest rate environment, I would not expect to see those those sh shifts where there's just limited resources that can't pro uh, process all the mortgages. But you know that could be one one positive factor for not QM from a uh, issuance perspective, um, an origination perspective. But you know from a more performance perspective, et cetera. Uh, can you discuss the non QM market a little bit? Sure. And, uh, you know, I don't, I sound, may sound like a broken record, but again, performance has been, had been really good in 2021 for all the factors we talked about. Speeds were high, but they're tapering back off. But, uh, you know, credit performance delinquencies declining, late stage um, delinquency buckets are also declining. Realized losses were relatively uh, low, you know, compared to the credit in, within the non-QM space. I think one of the things that helped uh, performance is, again, low low um, rates, again, non-QM rates, so low rates um, where issuers were able to get good financing or relatively good financing terms. So optional redemptions were, uh, were numerous and they were in the money for a lot of issuers. So you saw a lot of that activity which shortened up the, the term or duration of deals, which helped, you know, the shorter duration is, you know, all else equal, um, you know, you're paying your credit back faster. So uh, I think all of that uh, led to a good performance, but also uh, resulted, not resulted, but was because of a high issuance period during 2021. So um, from that standpoint, uh, it's what is the new, what do the new deals look like? So the season deals, again, benefited from all the things we talked about. Um, and to the extent that the conforming box, and again, there's a lot of configuration, but let's say, there's always uh, this trend where non-QM 
may eventually in the future qualify for QM or conforming. So that helps keep uh, prepayment speeds historically uh, a little bit above where conforming speeds are on a stable basis. So that I think it, it still bodes well for credit. Um, but to the extent that what ends up uh, in the latest pools, again, this is not a, a comment on selection, but just what's available and what borrower demand is, um, that may be because the QM box may be a little bit bigger, maybe the conforming box is a little bit bigger, the QM portion of the box. Now, um, you know, that might lend itself to uh, either underwriting guidelines, uh, maybe expanding a little bit, and then therefore that just leads to what goes into collateral pool. So that's a that's a timing and technical uh, aspect versus a asset selection <laughs> aspect. So um, that again that remains to be seen. But again, we have mandatory compliance for QM got pushed to October of this year. So um, you know to the extent that once we have full mandatory compliance, does that really determine where things shake out? Uh, it's going to come down to economics and liquidity for the loans, which structures make sense. Um, but again, from a performance standpoint, um, you know, from an issuance standpoint, uh, that could be, you know, kind of counterbalancing um, smaller QM portion of the box, but then more entrance and uh, maybe uh, innovative products, so on and so forth. And then going forward, as far as the credit performance, uh, it should be commensurate with the type of loans that make it into pools, uh, all else equal. If the backdrop stays the same, then, um, you know, that influence will be stable. Right. Okay, great. Um, you know, moving on to the GSEs and the CRT space there, um, you know, the, the Freddie, Freddie mentioned that they probably won't have the same issuance this year as they did last year, but last year was very strong. Uh, but Fannie, you know, we expect more than make up that difference. So uh, can you talk a little bit about what you expect to see out of the uh, GSEs? I know you, you touched on a few uh, few points there, but uh, maybe bring that all together. Sure. So let's start with uh, for the GSEs and credit risk transfer. So first thing is, um, to the extent that the latest FHFA scorecards came out, kind of uh, not mandating, but giving guidance to uh, what the GSEs are going to be uh, trying to adhere to. And so two big themes are affordability, housing affordability and availability of credit. And also, um, you know, kind of capital markets, uh, efficient capital markets execution. But the key thing here is if you look at the wording in the latest 2022 FHFA scorecard, the word significant risk transfer has returned. Um, that was, uh, that disappeared in the last scorecard as the previous FHFA um, administration or director uh, that was focused on a conservatorship exit. So now um, it's a different bent. And so again, that word significant risk transfer has returned. So to the extent that uh, you can take that as you will, but uh, it, it's in a focus uh, as far as public release. So therefore we would expect that uh, not only the com combination of conforming loan limit, affordable housing, uh, and significant risk transfer to help accommodate that, um, that should uh, put a, at least a, a subjective supportive backdrop for CRT issuance. Now, the, Freddie's comments about, um, you know, to the extent that, that what their issuance looked like, their issuance was, um, I'm trying to remember, it was, I want to say a record issuance year in 2021, but I will yes. say this, total sector, total sector CRT, Fannie and Freddie Cass Stacker, benchmark CRT, uh, 2021 was a record and Fannie Mae wasn't around for three quarters of that. So uh, that's uh, that's bows for uh, bows very well for 2022 heading into 2022 with Fannie Mae's return and their CAS program. And the latest deals uh, already in 2022, I think they're uh, one and a half, one and a half billion. So those are, you know, historically very large deals. So to the extent that now you have both uh, traditional issuers back in, um, even if Freddie is off, Fannie, um, you know, to the extent that they could do a lot more, uh, you know, depending on what their program looks like. So to the extent that uh, we could have either, you know, kind of, uh, I wouldn't say stable, but there could be um, a decent amount of upside considering that there's still uh, good housing activity. There's some refinance activity. Speeds are still up uh, around the, we'll call it the low 20, uh, the high 20s to low 30 CPR, which is still above uh, kind of steady state. And so that means their, uh, their portfolios, their guarantee books are still growing and therefore opportunities for, you know, continued CRT issuance. So uh, we'll see how, we'll see how it plays out with now both issuers um, back in the market. 
Yeah, and I, I think, you know, along with what you're saying, one of the expectations is to see uh, a higher detachment point. So each time that they each time they do securitize, there will be more bonds available on the market. So that that could also be, you know, there's a number of transactions, but there's also the volume of bonds that are issued per transaction. Sure. And just to kind of finish that off, um, not only did we see a trend uh, through 2021, but just in general, more uh, more of the lower part of the capital structure was being issued uh, in B1s and B2s. But also, too, now that uh, with the latest uh, stacker deal, for instance, they they had the M1A, M1B and the whole uh, kind of subordinate uh, percentage, I think, was four and a half percent, which is uh, higher than it usually is. Um, you know, a three a three handle. So that does put uh, more possible volume per deal uh, to be able to issue be issued into the market. Yeah, great. Okay, um, so moving on, I, I think kind of related to the GSEs is risk transfer from the mortgage insurer, so the MILN market. Um, oh, that that seems to be uh, moving moving along nicely. Any any. Uh, anything in particular to note on the MILN market? Sure. Um, I think quietly the ILN market, they had a, ILNs had a record issuance in 2021 as well. And what's interesting is that quietly, uh, I think the float now is around 20 plus billion. So if you look at GSE CRT at uh, roughly now, I think with the latest deals, that's 49 billion. Um, it's it's a pretty it's getting to be a pretty pretty significant I think it's significant already so uh, the amount of volume that's out there uh, and the float that's out there uh, is quite a bit and if I think uh, back to the GSC CRT growth I think that's uh, three years in I think that's when um, benchmark CRT hit 20 billion so um, to the extent that that's uh, that's relatively sizable for a uh, you know a credit sector um i think that bodes well and then going back to the gsc crt or just the gscs in general um to the extent that vast majority of collateral if not all the collateral is conforming high ltv conforming in the iln space well to the extent that the gsc guarantees t books grow um and that upside that allows for possibly more miln reference pool collateral uh to be risk transferred so again uh, i think uh you know, rising tides raise all shifts in this in this uh, in this pond, um, the conforming pond, uh, CRT and MILN uh, could go uh, together. But then again, it comes down to um, like capital and economics for the uh, the different MI companies, um, and then depending on how they look at it, based on their funding alternatives. Right. Great. So I think uh, also too, actually, you just reminded me sure. too, some structural differences. So there there had been structural differences uh, or enhancements uh, on the CRT and the ILN side. So I think you'll see um, there is a, a couple of key structural differences in the ILN space. One, uh, previously uh, before COVID, there were uh, static delinquency triggers, whereas now you move to dynamic delinquency triggers, which uh, you know is, is a lot more appropriate, um, you know, depending on the severity of delinquencies at any time period. And then also to the optional redemption periods, um, they're a little bit shorter. So again, uh, all else equal, uh, the structures um, are certainly different from the pre-COVID structures. So that's something to note, uh, you know, when you look at pre-COVID versus kind of COVID area, and I'd like to say we're still in the COVID area, hopefully one day we'll be in the post-COVID era. But, uh, you know, until then, uh, there's a difference in what the outstanding deals look like. Yeah, interesting. Okay, um, so another area that we've seen, you know, tremendous growth is the single family rental. So in, in SFR, you know, we, we've, we're seeing folks that were in SFR in a big way, got out, are now coming back in. Um, and, you know, just generally speaking, there's, there's, that's such a large space and there's such a housing demand um, that, that some issuers are, are actually having trouble sourcing products. So they're going to doing the build to rent and they're mm -hmm. looking to do more of that. So um, you want to talk a little bit about what you're seeing in the SFR market and then how the outlook looks for there? Sure, sure. And uh, I apologize in advance for some of the musings, but yes, SFR is one of those innovations. And if you really think about SFR, um, that was born, that market was born uh, or really got boosted uh, in the post-financial crisis period. So to the extent the GSEs um, had big REO inventories and you know they were looking to rent and selling off large swaths and, and 
you know, entire regions of homes um, and they become rentals. Again, that's one of the, uh, dare I say, you know, kind of the expansions or innovations that came from the uh, mortgage crisis. So to the extent that that's, uh, the, the SFR market, as people know, is highly regional. So it depends upon, um, you know, the uptake within different regions and, you know, com population density. But I think uh, overall, the credit performance has been, uh, again, this is a, sounds like a broken record, but has been, had been really good through the 2021 period. Um, tenant delinquencies may have ticked up, but to the extent that with SFR, uh, once the eviction foreclosure, eviction moratoriums ended, now you have the possibility of kind of removing, you know, non-paying tenants, replacing with paying tenants uh, as a possibility. Uh, but again, home prices uh, also help to the extent that, uh, you know, single family homes are up quite a bit. So um, rent, uh, rents have been, have raised uh, pretty well. And so that allows for more revenue into the uh, business models. So I think overall, um, you also see a lot of the migration, you know, where people move to and where the highest uh, rent re increases are. Um, I think that adds to uh, like more peculiar look at the SFR space. It's, it's kind of hard to say something in general because again, it's highly regional. Um, but to the extent that as far as outlook for 2022, given the housing market and conditions, um, I think, uh, you know, DBRS thinks that SF the FSOR rental rate will continue to increase. And I think that makes sense given housing costs and inflation, um, especially in, you know, major MSAs where there is a lot of SFR properties uh, in existence. Um, but to the extent that, again, it's a kind of a theme of resiliency in 2021, but kind of a a tempering in 2022, those rises might not be as fast. So to the extent that in some MSAs you saw um, rental rates go up by, you know, 10, 15 percent, yeah, that's probably going to taper off um, to the extent that, uh, you know, affordability becomes a factor and then, you know, relative to other housing options. So um, again, delinquencies were elevated, but again, that is one of the uniqueness, uh, unique things about SFR is where you're, you don't have a kind of a life, you know, static pool of borrowers um, to the extent that uh, landlords can uh, re-rent and replace tenants. Uh, that is a, you know, that's a positive, you know, to keep performance and revenues up. So um, to that extent, uh, there may be, you know, as you said before, there may be new entrants. Um, it is still a, uh, a space where issuers, acquirers, uh, there's a lot of demand. And so, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe you can talk about what you've seen, but, uh, you know, to the extent that there's upside as far as more entrance and still high interest in the sector um, after, you know, 2021 was a record deal volume year. Um, could 2022 follow that? Uh, again, it's, uh, it's more of a tempering, just like other asset classes. Yeah, no, we, we definitely see more folks coming into the space and and you know we're we're positive you know from a business development standpoint we're positive on issuance in the in the sfr space going forward so um we are coming near the near the end we're on our, our last topic i just want to remind folks um if you do have any questions please put them in the chat um and we'll we'll you know try to get to as many as we can so um the last topic is, is looking at some of the more off the run asset classes you know uh, I, I guess some of them, some that we're seeing are certainly investor loans. I know we talked a little bit about that. Um, second lien HELOCs, we're starting to see a couple of those come back. Um, there was a, a iBuyer transaction in the market. Um, we do expect to see other issuers uh, come back despite the, the issues that, that were with that space. And also uh, EBOs is, is another area where um, how those are funded and who owns them and how they may look to get leverage. Uh, those all sound, look like spaces that, you know, could, we could see some issuance this year. So uh, that's a lot, of, that's a mouthful, but um, any response you want to give to that would be appreciated. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, again, I think a lot of these, uh, like a lot of the uh, segments that you mentioned, uh, you know, are either emerging or have emerged or reemerged. So um, to the extent that, again, the backdrop is uh, a robust housing market tight supply, low financing rates, um, relatively good issuer execution, lender execution, the availability of capital, um, and you know, to the extent that you still have an improving economic backdrop to, you know, for homeowner debt service or, you know, housing debt service, I think all of that points to a lot of this uh, expansion, innovation, 
And, uh, you know, I think like, let's take, um, like we talked about investor loans, um, you know, the iBuyer universe that was, uh, that was intended to be, you know, a, a shorter term financing. Um, and then junior liens and HELOCs, all of the junior liens and HELOCs, we saw those, uh, you know, in the, in the pre-crisis period. So, um, again, re-emergence, emergence, um, I think, uh, right. With you know, there's a rising lot of interest rate environment, certainly, you know, that's, that's primes primes for the juniors, junior liens and seconds and HELOCs. Mm -hmm. so, yes. Yeah. Great. Um, you know, other areas, uh, the fix and flip market, there's, there's actually a, a healthy issuance in that space, all in the unrated. So not something we see too much of, uh, or study too hard, but, um, we definitely see it. And, it, you know, that is something that would be great if we could bring that into the fold to, uh, have turned those into rated transactions. Um, we're seeing some term warehouse securitizations. So instead of an alternate to warehouse lines, we're seeing um, warehouses being issued into the market and bonds. Uh, we discussed prior to this MSRs with the rising interest rate environment. Maybe maybe we'll see a few more MSRs come back. Um, and shared equity is is something that we see in the industry, people are putting money to work in that space. Um, you know, when when we'll start to see regular deal flow, I'm not sure, but you know, I could see that market uh, moving forward this year. So, any yeah, thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. And I think uh, I think one uh, one sector that I uh, I think uh, we should touch upon is the reverse sector too. Um, you know, we keep talking about home price appreciation, and that's the one of the one of the asset classes that uh, you know kind of really benefits from home price appreciation given the the cash flow um that comes from the loans themselves so uh to the extent that you know ending the year robust as far as issuance goes starting the year um you know and i know uh you know you've seen a lot so uh that's one segment where the performance again relative to other asset classes has performed in kind uh 2021 was a very good year um you know to the extent that uh the HPA has certainly helped collateralization. Uh, that's all positive. And then the proliferation of, let's say, you know, uh, government HECM versus proprietary loans, you know, that'll continue to evolve. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure you've seen and you can chat about uh, kind of what that activity looks like, because, uh, like I said, it, it ended the year brisk and it looks like it's starting out the year brisk as well. Yeah, well, you saved my banking because that's we have a very strong franchise in reverse mortgages, and that was on the list, and I skipped over it. So <laughs> I'm glad you brought it up. <laughs> but no, uh, you know, Derek Moran on on the you know DBS Morningstar team does a fantastic job in that space. Uh, he's he he leads our efforts there, and uh, certainly we're we're seeing robust um, issuance there, and and you know we don't see that's that really slowing down anytime soon. So. Uh, yeah, that's great. So, so um, with that, um, um, I think we're we're prepared to take some questions. Um, I don't know if there's. It doesn't look like we do have any questions. So, uh, Mark, unless you have something further, um, we can conclude this. No, I think uh, we covered a lot today. And again, uh, it was tough going up against the Fed and. <laughs> uh, but hopefully, uh, you know, we will provide a good, uh, a lot of information. And if anyone has any questions on any particular nuance uh, or, you know, materials that we talked about here or any of the past research reports that have gone out, uh, especially the credit performance reports, you know, just let us know and we'd be happy to uh, answer any, uh, any questions you may have. Yeah, so great. So, you know, just in closing, you know, Mark, of course, thank you for sharing your expertise. You're you're a well-known pro at this and, uh, you know, we're, we're lucky to have your, you know, your help on our research reports. Um, so thanks for spending your time with us uh, to the audience. You know, we appreciate that. We know that there's a million things going on. So thank you for joining us. Um, you know, we'll, we will continue our front live perspectives uh, webinars. We're always looking for topics. Uh, if you if anyone out there has areas of, of particular concern, um, please bring that to our attention. We can talk about it, or maybe we would even have a webinar um, on, on such topic. But uh, there will be a replay av available um, on the Bright Talk uh, website and, I, and the app as well. There's a DBRS Morningstar channel on that on that uh, web website. Um, 
and a link to this will be mailed to all uh, all attendees. So thank you again. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, everybody. And uh, that's the end of the uh, webinar. Thanks again, Rich. And take care, everybody. Thanks.